Thank you for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. It's a really nice day out. And I know pretty soon it's going to be raining every day. And every day counts. So um, I'm glad that you're here. And I'm glad that I'm here um, because this is a topic that is important to me. Um, by way of introduction, I am a heart failure specialist at Stanford. And I've been at Stanford. And actually, I lived in Redwood City for most of the time that I've been in California for the past nine years. Um, I've been on staff at Stanford now. This is my second year. And I'm somewhat unique at Stanford in that I see patients throughout the spectrum of heart failure. So I see patients who have just been diagnosed with heart failure, and also patients uh, who um, have developed heart failure and have been hospitalized. But uh, I see patients post-transplant as well, and also patients who have received assist devices. So we'll be talking about what that means today. Uh, but mostly, I wanted to talk about living well with heart failure. And it's funny, because uh, we, we get asked to give a lot of talks. Uh, and often, we cringe when, when the talk requests come. But this topic, I think, was uh, appealing to me for a number of reasons. This is actually what, what I talk to about my patients about every day. And I just came from clinic, actually. and so. Every day when I talk to my patients, I'm asking them, well, what can we do to improve your life? And that's really the, what sort of gets me out of bed in the morning. When I was in college, I majored in English. I wasn't a science major. So I've always had a sort of philosophic bent towards my profession. Um, and at the end of the tunnel you know, of college and medical school and residency and fellowship and super fellowship, um, now that is what really excites me is getting up and, and going to clinic and seeing my patients or seeing my patients in the hospital and seeing, well, what can I do to make their lives better? So um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation because I know that I tend to fall asleep during PowerPoint presentations. And I didn't want you all to fall asleep. And even worse, I didn't want to fall asleep. That would be bad for this talk. Um, so the bulk of this talk, I think, at the end is going to be your questions. And I really want to hear what you know, your concerns are about heart failure and be a resource for you to see what I can offer you in terms of uh, your questions about heart failure. In terms of the talk, living well with heart failure, I'm a pretty simple person, so I tend to break it down into the two different classes, living well and heart failure. And again, my uh, predilection is towards the living well part. I think um, what's unique about clinical medicine rather than, than research is that it's uh, particular to each patient. For living well for one patient may be a horrible life for another patient. And so the bulk of the visits that I spend with my patients in clinic are trying to figure out what living well means to them. And I think that all of you have an idea of what living well means to you. And we'll sort of explore that and how we can sort of supersede the confines of heart failure and still have an active and, and well life. So as I had said, I see patients through the whole spectrum of heart failure. I see patients who, are, who come to me, and I have to admit them to the hospital for a transplant. But I also see patients who are walking around and are just not quite up to par in terms of their <laughs> symptoms. And so what it sort of becomes in, in, at the initial visit with my patients is trying to figure out what their expectations are and what their limitations are. Um, and so what I've always been impressed about, and I continue to be impressed about, and it's part of the reason I chose heart failure as my specialty, is the resilience of my patients. I think that we don't often think about how much patients can overcome and supersede despite their illness to, and to have uh, an important and, and uh, a good quality of life. And a lot of patients come to me and say, well, how much do I have to modify my expectations? You know, and there are some patients in which their expectations are very stringently uh, modified. There are patients who, for example, you know, summit mountains, and then they come to me. And it, likely, they won't be going back to that. But there are other patients who, in terms of their quality of life, are able to get back exactly where they were before. So it's, again, it's, uh, it's difficult to tell patients where they're going to be in one or two years. I think it's always a when I'm talking about their quality of life, it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis and also a serial assessment. Because what we hope is that not just at this visit can I help them, but that over time they'll improve. So 
the other thing about heart failure is sort of the terminology. And I think a lot of people get upset when we tell them that they have heart failure. And people feel that they're backed into a corner. Oh, I have heart failure. I'm going to have a horrible life. I'm already a failure. And that's one way to look at it. I think that a lot of people think of heart failure as sort of the cancer of cardiology, because it's the mortality for heart failure is similar to the mortality in patients who have cancer. And also the, the sort of uh, hit that patients take in their quality of life is similar in patients with heart failure. But I don't see it that way. I, I see it that we're being honest with patients. And heart failure is exactly that. And we'll sort of, I won't touch go into pathophysiology or in too much detail, but I do want to explain that the reason that we call it heart failure is because the heart is not performing up to the body's expectations. For whatever reason, uh, in patients who have heart failure, particularly symptomatic heart failure, the heart is not um, meeting the body's metabolic needs, whether that be breathing or um, thinking normally or just walking to the mailbox, for example. And it's different, again, for different people. So I'll have some patients come to me and say, you know, my life isn't that bad, but I was told that I have heart failure, and that's why I'm in your clinic. But I can get by and do most of the things I want to do. But, you know, for example, they'll say, I can go to the mall and walk around, or I can do most of the things that I like to do during the day. But other patients will say, you know, I can get around and go to the post office, but that's not, just not enough for me. So one example I would use is someone like Lance Armstrong. You know, if he developed heart failure, he would have a significant decrement to his life because he's a performance athlete. So you may not know his story, but when he developed testicular cancer, he uh, decided not to get the best evidence-based uh, um, therapy for testicular cancer because one of the therapies actually hurts the lungs. And he's a cyclist, so he, didn't want to, he wanted to spare his lungs from that therapy. So when I have patients like that who come to my clinic, it's a little bit tougher because they have higher expectations. They have a higher quality of life, and they have a bigger decrement to their quality of life with heart failure. However, again, not only are our patients resilient in terms of their mental status, but the body is very resilient. So the body has this immense capacity to regenerate, but also compensate for uh, any decrement in its function. So we have two kidneys, for example. We don't need two kidneys. In fact, if I took out one of your kidneys, you would probably be just fine. And that's why some people can, can donate their kidneys to someone else. It's same with the lungs. And so we have a lot of duplication in our body. And also, we have that duplication and uh, compensation in our heart. A lot of times when we see patients, we're surprised about how much they can do when we see the condition of their heart via imaging or directly measuring their heart's capacity. It's only when the heart function is very, very low that patients become symptomatic. And so we know that if we can just improve that heart function a little bit, then we can get the patient to a better state and possibly a good quality of life. I'll briefly touch on the, the types of heart failure that we see. And there are two major types of heart failure. The first is systolic heart failure. And that's the most common type of heart failure and the type of heart failure that people talk about you know, in Time Magazine and in CNN.com. And that means that the pumping function of the heart is compromised when there's systolic dysfunction. If you want to be simple, and most cardiologists are very simple, despite all our training, we think of the heart as a pump. And so when the heart, the, and the heart is a muscle, so when it is very weak, it can't pump the re the enough blood or sufficient blood to the rest of the body. And so that affects the brain, and it also affects the kidneys that are the two major organs that uh, feel the effects first of the heart, uh, of, a, of a weak heart. So the brain compensates by saying, hey, I'm not getting enough blood. How can I improve the blood flow to myself? Because the brain tends to be pretty selfish. The egotists in the audience will know that. So um, the brain tends to respond by secreting hormones to augment the heart function. And one of the hormones that the brain secretes is called adrenaline. So you know adrenaline because for example, if you were crossing the street and a car was coming, were coming at you, then your heart would start pumping and you'd sort of be able to run across the street and avoid uh, the car. And so in the short term, adrenaline is good. It's a fight or flight hormone. In the long term, unfortunately, it's a bad hormone. And that's what happens to patients with heart failure. In the short term, they get better heart function by the secretion of adrenaline. But in the long term, the heart is sort of like flogging a dead horse is the way I uh, describe it to my patients or beating a dead horse in that 
uh, you're trying to squeeze as, as much life out of the, the muscle as possible, but in the end, you end up damaging that muscle. So most of the medications that we use for heart failure, and I'll talk about those, are blocking the effect of adrenaline. The other major effect of the heart when it's weak is on the kidneys. And uh, I spend a lot of time with each patient. Every new patient, I spend at least 30 to 45 minutes talking about their diet. And the reason is that heart failure is a state where people retain a lot of salt. So when the kidneys don't get enough blood, they say, how can I get more blood? The only way the kidneys know how to get more blood is by increasing the blood volume. So getting more blood in the arteries. And the way they do that is by holding on to salt. And if you hold on to salt, then there's more water that ends up in the body. The problem with that, as patients with heart failure know, is that if, even though there's more uh, water in the body, the water ends up in unexpected and unintended places. It ends up in the lungs, and people get short of breath. And it ends up in the legs, and so people get lower extremity swelling. So one of the major uh, components of heart failure therapy is restricting salt intake. And so I tell all of our patients, and I usually carry a breakfast bar with me, you know, if you, in terms of eat, uh, the salt intake that you can have, and we tend to be very strict about salt intake, probably more so than any other cardiologist, um, you can't have processed foods in, if you have significant heart failure. And that means not having any food that has salt as one of the ingredients. So a lot of our patients will come to us and say, and because our patients are very smart and they're very meticulous, and they'll say, OK, doctor, how many milligrams of salt should I have in my diet? And we tell them, we don't want you to think about how many milligrams of salt you have in your diet. Because A, it's very difficult to calculate. And then you have to carry a calculator around with you all the time and always be penciling in how much milligrams of salt you've been eating. And it's not very accurate. It's easier to say, as long as you don't eat processed foods or you don't add salt to your food, then you're following the kind of diet that we espouse and that our, our patients have had such success with. So that's a brief prelude to the treatment for heart failure, which I'll get into a little bit more. But I think the bulk of the talk, and I think these will be your questions in, in terms of living well with heart failure, are my philosophy about heart failure. And the, the main question that I ask every new patient that comes to my clinic is, what is most important to you? What is important in your life, and what are the things that you like to do? Uh, another question I always ask is, if there were one symptom I could take away today, what would that symptom be? Everyone has multiple complaints. You know, I'm sitting here and I have a little bit of back pain and my throat's a little bit sore. But there is, people with heart failure, I think, have one thing typically that they want. Either it's their breathing or their swelling in their legs or their energy. Those are all things that can be um, affected in patients with heart failure. And then we sort of tailor their, their therapy based on what they tell us. The other thing that's important, and I think that I've touched on this before, is that patients come to us at different points in their life and in different um, severities of heart failure. So we always try to get an idea of what the patient's trajectory has been. If a patient has had heart failure for 10 years and they've been stable and never hospitalized, that's a lot. We have a diff much different approach to that patient than to a patient who comes in gasping for air. Um, there is a not insignificant proportion of my patients who I admit straight from clinic to the hospital because they are so ill. But there are a lot, in fact, the majority of my patients who we follow out of the hospital in clinic serially, and they never get hospitalized. And really, that's our goal, is to have them at home as much as possible. So in terms of our therapies for heart failure, um, again, I'm a little bit old-fashioned in that I try to avoid as medications as much as possible because medications can be confusing, and they often have side effects. So the mainstay of the therapy that we have in terms of getting people better and improving people's lives with heart failure is modifying their diet. And so again, I've already preached to you a little bit, but I preach to all of my patients. And it's crucially important, so important, in fact, that not only do I speak to our patients about the diet, but then I have our nurse come in and talk to them and teach them even more extensively. I think because we do that, we have had a lot of success in our patients in terms of improving their symptoms. Because that's what re our patients really want, is an improvement in their symptoms, to be able to do more. In fact, to be able to, to have the quality of life they had before they were diagnosed with heart failure. And then we also do, because we are physicians, uh, use medications. And, and most of the medications that we use, again, are not expensive medications. I think that. Um, with Obamacare and, and all these changes in, in insurance, um, 
patients worry, and rightly so, well, can I afford these medications? Can I take the medications that I need to get my heart better? And what I can tell you is, and I'm happy to tell you this, it's not true in every specialty, most of the medications that we prescribe our patients are generic medications that you can get for $4 a month at Walmart. And we try to make an effort to get those medications and prescribe only those medications that patients can afford and take. And then beyond medications, and I was trying to pull up the, the video, um, there are other measures that we use in patients with heart failure. Sometimes our medications don't work. Um, my mentor at Stanford, uh, Dr. Michael Fowler, was one of the first physicians to use medications called beta blockers, which some of you in the audience may be familiar with. Um, and that was a revolution in heart failure. Before that, you would either have to get a transplant or patients would sort of waste away and die. It really was a bad time in, for, to treat patients with heart failure. But once beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and the other medications that we use for heart failure came about, it's a rare patient now that we have to think about transplant or the other options. I'll touch briefly about the other options because I think that uh, it's good to know about them. Um, for patients with end-stage heart failure. So again, I'm a, I'm a physician who not only sees patients who have poor heart failure, but also patients who get transplants. And I also run the left ventricular assist device clinic at Stanford. So I'll talk about transplant first, because most of you are probably a little bit more familiar with that. In patients who are either not tolerating medications or who are getting worse despite medication, we do think about transplant. Um, but transplant is not a walk in the park either. I always tell patients, and we try to be very honest with them, just like we are uh, when we talk to them about heart failure, that they could count on tripling the amount of medications that they take if they were to get a transplant, uh, as compared to the amount of medications they're taking for their heart failure. And their transplant carries with it its own set of complications. You're having someone else's heart in your body, so now you need to take medications to prevent rejection of that heart. So we're always walking a fine line in patients who get transplants between um, infection, because we're suppressing their immune system, and rejection, because we have someone else's organ in their body. And then there are other problems with uh, transplant. And patients can develop cancer, because your, it turns out your immune system is very important in terms of um, suppressing cancer and fighting off cancer. So we always have to worry about cancer surveillance in our patients with heart failure, in particular skin cancers. And kidney failure is also a common complication after transplant. However, it can be a very good option in patients who aren't thriving despite medications. Um, the one-year survival rate now is something like 90% in patients who receive transplants, or 85 to 90%. The 10-year survival, however, is more like 50%. So even though it's a more durable option for patients who are end stage, it's, there is a finite half-life to patients who get transplants. <laughs> More recently, and I don't know how familiar you are with this technology, uh, you may have heard that Dick Cheney, for example, got a machine put in his heart. And I won't get into politics and about whether that was a good idea or not, because he's still alive, unfortunately or fortunately for some people in the audience. But uh, he was at a patient with end-stage heart failure, and he was not thriving, uh, despite medications. And he was not thought to be a transplant candidate uh, for a number of reasons. So, uh, more recently, there's a new technology that's come out called a left ventricular assist device. It's a very fancy name, but we tend to abbreviate it and call it an LVAD. But what it essentially means is that it's a motor that we put in the heart to um, replace the heart's pump function. And so, as you can imagine, there were a lot of complications early on with this technology because you're putting a pump in someone's body. And so, early on, there were a lot of complications in terms of bleeding, and the pump breaking down. I can say that the technology has improved a lot. I'll be giving a talk a little bit later on, um, and I'll be debating with one of our other transplant cardiologists about whether patients should be getting transplants or assist devices now. Because assist devices are getting good. I wouldn't say they're at the, to the point where they're more durable or better than transplant, but they're getting there. However, assist devices have their own complications. And I won't dwell on them, because that's not the point of this talk. But it's another operation. You have to take a blood thinner, so there's a big risk of bleeding, and there's a risk of infection. And we have a couple, we have a couple patients in the hospital right now who have had infections. Um, they're being treated, and one of our other patients who got an infection actually just got a transplant. So 
you can use these devices either to get patients to transplant or as their therapy in case they can't get a transplant. So that was most of what I wanted to talk about. And I didn't really come here to hear myself talk. So I really want to hear you talk. I want to hear what, you, what questions you have about heart failure. And it can be any question, really, about your own heart failure or heart failure in general. Go ahead. I hear your emphasis on diet, but what about the exercise component? So I didn't talk about that, but that's the other component that we really focus on in our clinic. So after I've talked, spent 30 to 45 minutes talking about the diet, I spend another 15 to 20 minutes talking to patients about regular exercise. The reason for that is because uh, we found over time that uh, in patients who are in good shape, their heart tends to be in better shape too. And one of the big problems in terms of patients' quality of life is that when they come to us, the patients have compensated. So patients who have weak hearts, they either subconsciously or unconsciously tend to know that. And what we find once we really delve into their history, for example, is, yeah, you know, I haven't been feeling well for the past year. I used to mow the lawn, but now I don't do that anymore. And then for the last six months, I haven't really been walking around the block as much as I used to. And so they self-regulate their activity to the point where they're at the level of activity that's appropriate for their heart failure. But once we treat patients for heart failure, we are very aggressive in terms of their exercise. I tell every single patient of mine, no matter how sick they are with heart failure, that they need to walk at least, or exercise, at least 30 minutes a day every single day. So, you might say that's a bit harsh. If a patient has come to me gasping for air, maybe it's not the best idea for them to be walking 30 minutes, around, uh, or 30 minutes at a time. But what we tell them is they don't have to walk 30 minutes all at once. Uh, they can walk for 10 minutes in divided intervals. They can walk 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, and 10 minutes in the evening. And I do appreciate, and that was the other video, and if you ever get a chance to go to YouTube, you can just type in my name, and there's a video uh, where I talk about how important exercise is to the heart. Um, it's crucial. And I think that um, even that 10 minutes gets patients uh, on the right path. And they get used to the idea of heart failure. So I talked earlier about the limitations that patients have and sort of the resilience that they have. And I think patients get surprised because They've been told, frankly, by other physicians, you have heart failure, you shouldn't exercise. And so I can say that you know, we're a center that specializes in heart failure. And every patient I see almost has heart failure. And so far, we haven't had any patients. Uh, how strenuous should the exercise Sure. So what we tell our patients is that they know their bodies much better than we do. And so <laughs> every patient that I see, and it's funny that you bring that up, I tell them, you know. You should do the 30 minutes a day every day. But it doesn't have to be running. And you don't have to run a marathon. And you don't have to be sprinting up and down hills. You know, all you need to do is walk on level ground. And you could do that. Again, not, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes all at once. But it can be, again, in divided intervals. So an, do I have to push myself to the point where I'm sweating? Or no, you don't. <laughs> so can you repeat the questions as they're asked? Sure. So his question was, well, how? You just told me that I need to exercise 30 minutes a day, but you haven't told me what level of exercise I need to achieve and how strenuous my exercise should be. And what we always want, we do want patients to push themselves, but not to the point of exhaustion. So I tell my patients, and a lot of my patients and most of my patients are motivated, and they'll say, you know, I did a lot of exercise like you said, and then the next day I felt completely exhausted and I couldn't do anything. Well, that's too much. Or they'll say, you know, I did a lot of exercise, and later that night, I yelled at my wife when she was cooking dinner. So if you're all grouchy that night or you're exhausted the next day, that's too much. You're pushing yourself too hard. If you find that you have to stop in the middle of your exercise because you're having chest pain or shortness of breath, that's too much. And so what we ask our patients to do, and that's why initially when I see a patient, I see them very frequently, is to gradually increase their exercise. And at the beginning, particularly because patients can be more tenuous, I, ask, I have them just walk at a regular pace so that they're not out of breath. I, I don't ask my patients to push themselves to the point where they're sweating or out of breath. Go ahead, ma'am. Can we substitute swimming about 45 minutes of swimming? I think that swimming is the best activity you can. Oh, sorry. So the question is, can you substitute swimming 
for walking. And from my perspective, any aerobic exercise is good. And uh, aerobic exercise is the best. I would say, just to take it aside before I answer your question about the swimming, that we try to avoid heavy lifting or, medic or um, exercises that are anaerobic. So a lot of our patients come to us and say, well, can I go back to benching you know, 250 pounds? And I say, well, you know, I've never been able to bench 250 pounds, first of all. But, but second, no, that's, that's probably not a good idea for a couple of reasons. One is because aerobic activity is better for improving your heart function, and two, the activity of lifting strenuous or heavy or lifting strenuously or lifting heavy weights is the exact opposite of all the medications that we use for heart failure. They actually lower your blood pressure and reduce the stress on the heart. So if you're lifting heavy weights, that kind of activity is the sort of anathema for patients with heart failure. To answer your question about swimming, I think that's the best activity you can do for heart failure. Uh, and in general, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's a very aerobic activity. And you can stop in the middle of swimming, right? And, you, and if, depending on if you're not in the deep end, then you can just you know, stand there. Um, the other thing about swimming is that it's not a load on your, on your uh, knees. And so a lot of our patients with heart failure tend to have arthritis or other problems. And so you get rid of that uh, part of the equation when you're swimming. So I think swimming is, is an excellent activity. Yes, sir? What heart rate would you target? So the question is, what heart rate should you target when you're exercising? And we don't, again, I think that our patients, particularly in the Bay Area, are too intelligent. Because they're always asking about numbers and you know, how many milligrams of salt and how, what you know, number for the heart rate. And so we try to tell our patients, again, it's not so much a number that we target, but how you feel. So your heart rate could be 120, but if you feel fine, then you should continue your activity. Now, I would say that there are probably ranges beyond which it's dangerous. So if your heart rate is consistently above 150, say, that's probably a sign either that you have an arrhythmia or that you're doing too much. However, we have patients who have well-compensated heart failure who do exercise and get their heart rates up to 150. And I don't tell them, you know, keep your heart rate down. Yes, sir? Do you know this word called a tripod? What's tripod? Do I know, I'm sorry? Tripod. Do I know of, uh, about the tripod? The medical term in, uh, in the heart. Call. Tricare, tripod. Tripod? Tricare. Tripods. Like, in, a, in, 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 in medical term called a tripod. Do I know of a medical term related to the heart called a tripod? Mm -hmm. No, I don't. What's happening is that Lung collapsed okay. in March. So I was in the ICU. They they took feeding me, and uh, then they says uh, my heart was too heartbeat too slow. Okay. So they put a center line to me and uh, to try to increase my heart. Okay. And uh, for some reason my heartbeat went up to like two hundred. Mm -hmm. They have to shut me down and restart. Okay. Well, I'm glad you made it. Yeah, I still remember that was done by the nurse because the ICU nurse was so good, better than the doctor. So they, oh, okay. they decide, I do it, okay? So they shut me down and restart. So I remember the image was like. <laughs> right, I'm sure that they shocked you. Uh -huh. Yeah. So my heart be back to normal. Okay. So they overheard. Oh, I know there's a tripod somewhere, but I didn't hear that. So, so uh, that's still a mystic to me. I don't know why they talk about tripod. OK, well, it's a bit of a mystery to me, too, because I've not heard that term before. Um, it might have been something to do with the rhythm problem that you had. Uh, and I think that that terminology was probably related to that rhythm problem that you have. Something like that. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the charts and looking right. for for pirates of child looking for that. What they were probably trying to look for is exactly what kind of rhythm you were having. Uh, but anyway, so later on, they put me on this machine after I recovered from the collapse. Mm -hmm. they, they inject the dye, the nuclear dye, into mm -hmm. my system and monitor my heart. The blood flow in your heart. 
<laughs> then they says that there's no blockage, but uh, my compression of the ratio is 54%. <clears throat> and they says, uh, as long as you're over 50%, you're okay. And then <laughs> I, learned, I learned later on from my respiratory specialist, they says, normal people are between 50 to 70. Like my brother-in-law can go to the Tibet. He must be over 90. Mm -hmm. So this is a very good question, actually. So your question is, a lot of, yeah, is 54% of heart function okay? And so, again, we throw a lot of numbers out to our patients, and I think that we can confuse them. One way we measure heart function, remember the heart is a pump, and it squeezes blood out of the body, uh, to the rest of the body. So one way to measure how well the pump is functioning is to look at what percentage of blood gets ejected from the heart with each beat. And what we call that is the ejection fraction, or EF. I don't know. Some of you may have heard of that term. So when they were telling you that your function was 54%, they weren't saying normal person is 100%. You are only 54%. I would be shocked, and I would be upset if someone told me that. But actually, 54% is normal. So the range of normal for the ejection fraction, or the amount of blood, the percentage of blood that is pumped out of the heart, is between 50 to 70%. So 54% is actually perfectly normal. Well, you're still walking around, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm an A student. I never got anything lower than B, but I think 54%. 54% is maybe an A minus. I think that's an A minus, so. Go ahead, sir. Um, how do you know when you have heart failure? What are symptoms or you know, early signs of it? So that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, how do you know when you have heart failure? I think that it, it's an important question because the older that people get, or maybe I'll say the more mature that people get, um, the higher the chances are of heart failure, right? And so we know that, for example, when a per someone reaches 80 years of age, maybe 20% of those people will have a diagnosis of heart failure, much higher than, for example, at 60 years of age. So, the, so heart failure tends to increase in prevalence the, high, the older that people get. So it is an interesting question. Well, how, what should I look out for? And you know, the, e, the, the quick answer, I think, is that if you're able to do all the things that you like to do in your life, then you probably don't have anything to worry about. If you are someone who is fairly active and, and you know, mows the lawn and, and uh, you know, plays a little bit of tennis or something like that, then you don't have to worry. The time to worry is when you can't do your activities of daily living, as we call them. So you're normally a racquetball player, and then you find out you, you, beat, you beat someone seven times in a row, your regular partner, and then one day it's hard to beat them. Or you're a swimmer, as you mentioned. And this is something that comes up quite a bit and is a very common presentation. And they say, you know, I'm able to swim, you know, I'm not a swimmer, so I don't know, 1,000 meters in 23 minutes. But you know, for the last two weeks or the last month or so, I've, it's been taking me half an hour. So when you are able to find that you are not up to par in terms of your own clinical status. And, you, and, you're, and the cardinal symptoms are shortness of breath, swelling in the legs, unexplained weight gain. Then that's a good time to either tell your primary doctor or your cardiologist, you know, I'm a little bit worried. And we're fine with uh, screening you for that. It doesn't have to be a very expensive test. It can just be a physical examination. That's how I diagnose most of our patients with heart failure. Did you have a further question? It's fairly, it's fairly sudden, or I mean, it's not just aging, but it's. Um, no, well, so. The, months, you so the question is will it always be sudden if I develop heart failure, or can it be gradual? And unfortunately, it can be very gradual, because again, the heart is, and the body in general is so good at compensating that often it compensates very well, and you don't d realize that you have heart failure until you sort of fall off the cliff. and and the heart can't compensate anymore. So it could be gradual. And again, the things to keep out for and, and keep in the back of your mind are, am I slowing down more than usual? You know, well, some people will say, well, you know, now that you think about it, or now that you ask me, doc, for the last two months, I haven't been able to get to the mailbox as quickly. But people don't sort of keep that in their mind. If you have an idea of regular, and that's the other reason, I think. And one thing I didn't emphasize enough today is prevention is that 
the best thing is that I never see you in my clinic. I don't want to see any of you in my clinic or ever talk to you about transplant. You know, it's bad for business, but frankly, it would make me very happy never to see any of you in my clinic or at Stanford Hospital. And so the way to do that is to prevent heart failure. And the pr way to prevent it is to stay active, you know, control blood pressure, control your cholesterol. And so I do see patients who come to me who are referred for heart failure, and then I examine them and they don't have heart failure, but they have risk factors for heart failure. And what I tell them is exercise regularly. Because if they exercise regularly, when they develop signs of heart failure, they will know sooner than someone who doesn't exercise because they will be exerting themselves. And they will know because their heart won't be able to keep up. You set up a wrench. Exactly. When you see the wrench becoming narrow, mm -hmm. that means there's a signal. Exactly. Go ahead now. Is heart failure a one way street? Once you have it, can it be reversed or is it a continual? So the question is heart failure. It sounds pretty bad. It's failure. Can you ever reverse it or are you always stuck with this diagnosis of heart failure? And what I would say is that it can be reversed and improved, but in my, my philosophy is that once you've had heart failure, you're always a heart failure patient. And there's a number of reasons for that. It used to be that we used to think of heart failure in terms of patient symptoms. So there was this classification of heart failure, and I won't bore you with the details, but of one through four. And you were very severe. You were the fourth classification of heart failure when you get short of breath with just minimal activity. And you were the best classification of heart failure when you were class one and you didn't have any symptoms. So that's a nice way to classify patients when they come to clinic. The problem, as I'm sure some of you have realized, is that patients can go from class four to class one heart failure if they get treated. You could take someone with really bad heart failure and treat them optimally and they would have no symptoms. Does that mean they don't have heart failure? No. Does that mean that they're not at risk for a future death? It doesn't. And so I think we did our patients a disservice when we used that sort of classification. So now when I see patients, and uh, there's a physician at uh, University of Pennsylvania who came up with this classification, we think about stages of heart failure. We think of heart failure as a progressive disease, uh, and the, the stages are very simple, A through D. And so the first stage is risk factors for heart failure. So if you have risk factors for heart failure, you can't ever not have risk factors for heart failure. So you can't go back to you know, stage zero. And then further on, if you ever develop symptoms of heart failure, you're stage B. And so the nice thing about this classification is that we've identified patients who are at risk for heart failure who should continue to get therapy. So in one sense, to answer your question, I would say that once you have a diagnosis of heart failure, you are always at risk and you're a patient that we always worry about in terms of developing heart failure. However, there is a significant proportion of patients with heart failure who stay at one stage. They don't get worse. So I have patients who I've been seeing now in clinic for five years, and they have stage B heart failure. They have heart failure. Their heart was weak at one time. We gave them medications, and now it's normal. So I still say that they have heart failure, and they still come to my heart failure clinic, but they have no symptoms, and they have no progression. And in fact, they've had improvement in their heart failure. So I don't think that it's a death knell diagnosis, heart failure. I think that you can improve. What I think it means is, and it's similar to patients who have diabetes, it means a whole lifestyle change, and it's a change for the rest of their lives. It's something that they always have to live with and always have to be mindful of, that I'm someone who's susceptible to environmental insults or heart, you know, worsening in heart failure. So I have to be a little bit better than other people do in terms of taking care of myself. Yes, ma'am. Really ever lead to diabetes? That's a very interesting question. So the question is, does heart failure ever lead to diabetes? So the reason it's interesting is because at Stanford we do research because we're a research hospital, and one of my areas of research is diabetes and heart failure. And so um, we are very interested in the question of, A, are patients who have diabetes, who develop diabetes have a higher risk of getting heart failure, but B, does it also go the other way around? Do patients who have heart failure develop more diabetes? And we tend to think that it is true that patients who have heart failure have a higher risk of diabetes. And some of the research in our group has shown that if you take a patient with heart failure, they are not as good as um, metabolizing glucose as patients who, have, who don't have heart failure. So we are always struggling in our patients with heart failure with um, their sugar levels and uh, treating the diabetes if they develop it. The other thing, though, is that when we treat their heart failure and their heart failure improves, they often 
often their diabetes improves and they don't require insulin or medications for their, for their diabetes. So they sort of go hand in hand, and, and numerous studies have shown this. So we're actually doing trials now at Stanford in patients with heart failure by giving them agents to improve their diabetes and seeing if their heart failure improves. There's other data out there that maybe some of you are aware of that, for example, patients who um, are very obese and develop um, and uh, require gastric bypass surgery. Some of those patients also have a lot of uh, fat accumulation in their hearts and also have weak hearts. There are case reports now of patients who have developed diabetes and who have bypass surgery who lose a lot of weight and their heart function goes from 20% to 60% to normal. Yes, sir. Uh, I said I'm right on because I'm diabetic since 96. Mm -hmm. And I have this problem uh, since this year, okay, with heart problems. And uh, after I got out of the hospital, I lost like 20 pounds. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I was high in the hospital, I was 350, and now I'm 310. So That's wonderful. And uh, then I retired. Okay, so I do a lot of change to adapt to the. And uh, then they gave me Roco. They gave you what? Zoco. Local? Level standing. Okay. Make my blood sugar go like this. Uh -huh. So I said, stop it. So then you back to normal again. So, uh, so it's interesting what you're saying because, again, so the, I guess the, what this gentleman was saying is that since he's lost some weight, I think that his symptoms have improved. And I think that you had mentioned, well, what about exercise? One of the main reasons that we ask our patients to exercise with heart failure is to maintain or decrease their weight. One way that you can think of the heart and its uh, demands is that the more mass you have, the more blood has to be pumped. So w what we found in a lot of our patients, and not just because diabetes improves in patients with heart failure, is that once you can decrease that load on your heart, and losing weight has a number of effects, not just uh, decreasing uh, diabetes, but also decreasing blood pressure. And many of the medications, as I have just spoken, uh, for heart failure decrease your blood pressure. If you can do that with your weight, and again, I'm someone who's against using medications unless you absolutely have to, then you can naturally improve the heart function, or at least uh, decrease the stress on the heart. I think that uh, one mainstay that we talk about in clinic is how can we reduce stress on the heart? And that's not just physical stress or physiologic stress, it's also emotional stress. And I'll just touch on this briefly, but, but you, go ahead. If I go which I have money, if I go for a liposuction, mm -hmm. take some of my fat out of my tummy, mm -hmm. that one's uh, very drastic, but can lose like another 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. Should I go for it? Okay, so that's a difficult question to answer, not, not being your personal physician, and I would never make any sort of determinations without examining you and seeing you in clinic. Liposuction, so the question is, you know, what about liposuction? Is that a good option in terms of improving my heart? So liposuction tends to be um, a pretty drastic surgery, and uh, there's not very good data about liposuction in patients with heart failure. There's a lot better data in terms of bypass surgery or gastric bypass or the laparoscopic banding in terms of uh, improving outcomes. So I can't tell you that liposuction would be a good option. I can say that losing weight and losing fat would be a good option and, and would likely lead either to better heart function or a lower likelihood that you would develop heart failure, but it's not clear to me that, that liposuction would be the best option. Yes, sir. Uh, when is a pacemaker uh, indicated? Yeah, value and what does it do? Good. So, the, so the, the question is, what about a pacemaker? And so, again, uh, how is that helpful in patients with heart failure? So there's there are two uses for pacemakers or slash defibrillators in patients with heart failure. In patients, so some patients with heart failure, particularly those who've had heart attacks before, have a high risk for rhythm problems in their heart. So for example, you said that you'd had a rhythm problem. That can often happen when you're very ill, but it can also happen when your heart is very weak. Um, that can happen either because a scar has formed in the heart from a heart attack, or because the heart is so big and stretched out that it develops a rhythm problem. So in patients who, despite medications, their heart remains big, or they've developed rhythm problems, we think about putting defibrillators in them. And the reason we do that is because 
Many studies have shown that if you put a defibrillator in a patient with severe heart failure that has not improved, you can reduce the risk that they would die from an arrhythmia. So we try to be careful because we're trying to conserve healthcare dollars, but we only try to, and, but that's not the only reason that we try to uh, avoid putting pacemakers or defibrillators in. I tend to be very conservative because, again, just like transplant isn't a walk in the park, neither is a pacemaker because there are complications to pacemakers. It's a minor surgery, but you're putting wires in your heart, so there's a risk of infection. And then uh, a pacemaker doesn't last forever, so every five years or so you have to have the battery changed. So why put a device like that in your heart if you can get away without it? So the guidelines from our Heart Failure Society say that you should try to wait at least three months and after having treated some, while treating someone with heart failure before you consider putting a pacemaker in. I had a patient who came to our clinic, and I just saw her today, um, who had had a pacemaker placed in, or a defibrillator placed, placed for heart failure, but she had never been treated for heart failure before. And she developed an infection, and, had, and that's the first time I saw her in clinic, I had to put her in the hospital to have her whole pacemaker system taken out. So now she's without a pacemaker, and we're just treating her heart failure, and I'm hoping she can escape having that done. So one indication for a defibrillator is for patients who have weak hearts that haven't improved to prevent sudden death. The other indication for a pacemaker, and now there's been a special type of pacemaker, is to improve the heart function directly. And you may have heard of this before, but I'll briefly explain it for the rest of the audience. In heart failure, not only is there uh, a problem with the muscle of the heart, but sometimes there's a problem with the electrical system of the heart, the conduction system of the heart. So you can have fast rhythms, but you can also have slow rhythms in the heart. And, the other, and so one big problem that we see in patients with heart failure is that the conduction system gets blocked. And we can see that when they do their electrocardiogram. And there are some patients who have so much delay in their heart that their heart beats out of synchrony. It's dyssynchronous. So normal person's heart should be together. All the walls should contract at the same time because they all reach, receive the electrical impulse at the same time. There are some patients with heart failure and, and not a, a minority of patients who beat like this. One wall of their heart beats and there's a delay in the contraction of the rest of their heart. Those are the patients that we think could benefit from a special type of pacemaker that actually paces the left side of the heart or the side of the heart that's getting delayed. It's called a biventricular pacemaker or resynchronization therapy. And so there are some patients, and again, we have to wait, we tend to wait for a few months to make sure that the medications don't improve their heart function. But resynchronization therapy, and actually Dr. Wang up here is one of our electrophysiologists who performs that therapy for us, um, that can lead to dramatic improvements in heart function. So I have had patients whose ejection fraction or heart function is 20% and their heart function goes to completely normal with one of these special types of pacemakers. But we have to choose these patients carefully because, again, there are complications to the procedure, and we don't want to put these uh, defibrillators or pacemakers in if a patient doesn't need them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is uh, skip beat related to the heart failure? Is what related to heart failure? Skip beat. Skip beat. Skip beat. Skip. Skip oh, beats. skipped beats. Oh, skipped beats. Oh, God. I, was I hope not. So the question is, are skipped beats related to heart failure? And um, typically not. So often patients uh, will have skipped beats, and that's actually a normal phenomenon. So I typically sometimes have skipped beats in my heart. I hope I haven't checked myself lately, but probably I don't have heart failure. But uh, uh, once people get more mature as they age, they often have skipped beats. There are some people, however, that have very frequent skip beats that do have a higher propensity for developing heart failure. These are patients, for example, who might have, if you, your heart beats 60 times a minute, maybe 10 or 15 skip beats in a minute. And so in those patients, sometimes when we're concerned that the skip beats are causing their, a heart problem, we'll put them on a heart monitor and see how many skip beats do they have. And if it's a lot of skip beats, then we do consider whether that could be contributing to heart dysfunction. But as a general rule, for example, uh, this gentleman was asking, well, how do I know whether I'm developing heart failure? I wouldn't put skip beats in that category. What I would put in that category is more significant palpitations. So many skip beats that you feel faint. So more if you have skip beats and you have symptoms like, you know, occasionally I have skip beats, but yesterday I had an, you know, 10 beats in a row that were fast, and I felt like I was about to pass out. That's something to tell your physician about. Go ahead, sir. Uh, 
What is the connection between an injection fraction and heart failure <coughs> in terms of the numbers? If uh, the injection fraction is normal, what does that mean in terms of heart failure? So the question is, we talked about ejection fraction and how that's a measure of the cardiac function or heart function. How does that relate to heart failure? Excuse me. Sorry. So um, that's a bit of a complicated question because you can have heart failure with a normal ejection fraction. And we call that diastolic heart failure. So I didn't talk about it too much, but there's two functions of the heart. The heart is a pump, and so it squeezes blood out to the rest of the body. But it also receives blood from the rest of the body. So there can be a derangement or problem with the squeezing function of the heart, but also the receptive function of the heart, the relaxation function of the heart. And it turns out that more and more people are being diagnosed with this, which is called uh, diastolic heart failure, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So to answer your question, I'm getting referred a lot of patients, uh, and I'm sort of becoming the primary person who treats diastolic heart failure in our clinic. And these are patients who have normal heart function by echocardiogram in terms of the squeezing function of the heart, but they have a stiff heart. So how do we determine whether they have a stiff heart? The way we determine it is by checking the pressures in their heart. And you can do that with an ultrasound of the heart. Can, and typically, the patients that develop diastolic heart failure or heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction are patients who have thick hearts, so patients who have had high blood pressure for a long time. And so one way we determine whether they have that kind of problem is to see how thick their heart is, but also how severe the pressure elevation is in their heart. In extreme cases, we'll take patients to the cath lab, and so I'll take them to the cath lab and directly measure their pressures in their heart to see if the pressures are too high. So that's one part of the answer to the, your question. The other part, though, is say the diastolic or relaxation function of the heart is normal. At what point do we get worried and call it heart failure when, at what number of their ejection fraction? So I don't tend to worry if a patient, A, doesn't have symptoms, but also if, B, the heart, the heart function is you know, at least 50%. So below 50% is when we start worrying about not only um, whether they have uh, heart failure, but about treating heart failure. Because there's pretty good data now, and I think you all are very um, keen on getting to heart failure early, and so am I. Because the earlier you catch heart failure, the easier it is to treat, and the better the outcomes are. We have a lot of patients who come to us very late, and it's very difficult to turn heart failure around. But if we can get a patient whose heart function is 45%, and we catch them early in their course before they have severe symptoms, we have a much better chance of getting to them to normal function. So that's when we start thinking seriously about treating them, even if they don't have symptoms. So I do get referred patients who are asymptomatic, who come to my clinic, but whose cardiac function is not normal, their ejection fraction is less than 50%, and I do start treatment at that time. I think you had a question, ma'am. Um, yes, I want to throw two numbers out. Okay. I, my pulse is normally in the 40, less than 50. Um, my diastolic blood pressure is less than 60 usually. Are those worrisome kind of things? So the question is uh, two parts. One is, if my pulse is below 50, should I worry? And two, if my diastolic blood pressure is less than 60, should I worry? So I'll answer the easier one first, the one about diastolic blood pressure. Um, <coughs> Most of the studies that have looked at blood pressure and the effect on bad outcomes like stroke, heart attack, and death have looked at systolic blood pressure. So I tend to ignore the diastolic blood pressure in my patients. So if your diastolic blood pressure is you know, 50, but your systolic blood pressure is 110, I don't worry about it. As long as you're feeling OK, it's, I'm, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I worry a lot more when the systolic blood pressure is something like 80. However, I have a lot of patients in my clinic, and again, this gets back to the theme of it depends on how you feel and what your body is like, who walk around with a systolic blood pressure of 80 and feel perfectly fine. Now, to answer your question about uh, the heart rate, it's actually a very similar answer. Um, a lot of patients will worry because 
they are told, and rightly so, you know, if your heart rate gets below 50, you might have to stop taking your beta blocker or um, call your physician. And so I always say, you know, call me if your heart rate's below 30, because that way my patient won't call me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, um, but what's more important to me is how my patients feel. I do have patients who walk around with heart rates in the 40s, and I have them on beta blockers, and I don't stop them because the beta blocker is such an important medication for these patients and actually prevents their heart failure from getting worse. And as long as those patients are not having symptoms, and symptoms being exercise intolerance, they can't walk as much because their heart rate is so low, or they feel faint because their heart rate is so low, I don't worry about it. So again, it's hard to answer this question in a vacuum for your particular case, because I don't know your medical history. But if you don't have any symptoms and your heart rate's in the 40s, then I wouldn't think that's an alarming thing. Exercise, such as swimming uh, uh, in the fitness room on these ellipticals, a bicycle, mm -hmm. plus every day I do stuff in the room, stretching and whatever. Does your heart rate go up when you exercise? I don't know because uh, I usually, well, on this elliptical, when I'm going as fast as I can, mm -hmm. there's a place you can check your heart rate, right. and sometimes it's you know, in the high seven. Okay, so that's a good sign. You know, I would be worried if your heart rate didn't go up with exercise. So, you know, again, not giving you personal medical advice, but I think that uh, a heart rate in the 40s and the fact that you're able to do all those activities without any problems is a good sign, and I wouldn't worry too much about that heart rate. And I always, when I swim, I give a stop right. motion because I figure, you know, I know how far I'm going mm -hmm. and how long it should take me. And if it goes up, then that would be something to think about. Exactly. Exactly. Um, go ahead, sir. How do you uh, measure the ejection percentage? So that's a good question. The question is, how do you measure the heart function? How do you measure this ejection fraction? It's a, a bit controversial because it depends on who you ask and, and who is reading the test. And one big problem, uh, and it's something we often encounter, you know, we think that we're Stanford, so we're the best at reading these tests. And you should always come to Stanford to have your echoes. Uh, and that's why we make them so expensive. But, um, <laughs> but um, the fact of the matter is that it's a subjective interpretation to a large extent. There are ways that we measure it. But a lot of it is, is looking at the heart and saying that is within the normal range. And it, we put a number on it, a percentage. And usually, if you're a very good echo reader, and then you can be within 5%. But there is some variability. So there's a number of tests that we use to measure ejection fraction. One is an echocardiogram. That's an ultrasound of the heart. And so you can see the walls of the heart moving. And what we do is we see how far in the walls of the heart move during a heartbeat. And then we measure the volume at the biggest point of the heart when it's the most full. And we subtract the volume from when it's very small. And then we, that's how we get the ejection fraction. Another way to do it, your test, when they injected the, the medication, is a blood flow test. They inject a, a um, radioactive isotope. And it goes to your heart. And it, um, it, it basically flows through all of your heart. And there's a computer algorithm that measures it, the, the ejection fraction. And so there are quantitative ways to measure it. but. I can tell you that even those ways are fraught with uncertainty. And so sometimes uh, there can be a significant variability. And so a lot of times we go more, more by how the patient feels than by that number. It's unfortunate because our patients do fixate on numbers. And, in, and I understand that. When a patient is very ill and they're grasping for anything to see, for any sign that they're feeling better, they want to know if that number has gotten better. The problem is, if there's a 5% variability, one day the number could be 26%, and the next day it could be 28%. Did they really get better because it was 28%? Probably not, but the patient's really happy. So what I tend to do is tell the patients when the number's better, but not tell them when it's worse. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. I, I, because I personally went through that, and if I add something. In the hospital, as it was Kaiser, they want me to sign all kinds of paper because they want to increase um, increase the load, which is either exercise or give me another shot to increase my heartbeat okay. during the measurement. This says, oh, last year one guy got a heart attack when we were doing this. Uh -huh. And uh, I was going to cry and walk out of there. They said, you're not the only one. There's a whole bunch of people who was crying. 
by the time you do this. So you want somebody ask you to do that, go, go ahead and do it. If I can do it, yeah, you can do it. So your question is, what's the risk of having these stress tests that you had? I think it's the minimum. No. So, there are, so it's actually a good question. Um, there are a number of tests that we do to look at heart function. And one is that we can look at the heart function when a patient is resting. We can do an echocardiogram. But it can be very important or, and helpful to see what a patient's heart is like under stress. Because one of the biggest causes of heart failure is if the blood flow in the heart is impaired. And so when patients are under stress, if there is a problem in blood flow, it can often be brought out by the stress. So there are a couple of ways that you can stress a patient. One way is to put them on a treadmill and have them walk. That's the best way, because then we can directly measure their exercise capacity. Another way is to make the heart work with a medication. And I think that's what they were trying to do with you. You can inject a medication to force the heart to get stressed. And so there are side effects to these medications, and that's why we, don't, we try to use the treadmill. I will say that it's very rare that you would have a side effect. And frankly, at Stanford, I've never seen a patient have for example, die from a stress test. But patients do get rhythm problems when they get these injections because these medications augment the heart function. They, they directly increase the contractility of the heart. And because of that, they can cause rhythm problems. So that's one of the biggest side effects is rhythm problems during a stress test. Go ahead, sir. Are there techniques to improve the flexibility of heart muscles? So that's a very good question. The question is, are there techniques to improve the flexibility of the heart muscles? We've talked, most of the medications and most of the, the, the talk today has been about the pump function or the squeezing function of the heart because that has been the bulk of the problem uh, over the past 50 years, dealing with systolic or squeezing heart failure. And that's why most of the medications that we have for heart failure deal with systolic heart failure and improving people whose ejection fractions are low. Unfortunately, and, and the reason it's unfortunate is because we're seeing more people with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or relaxation problems in their heart. There aren't any medications out right now that are evidence-based that have been shown to improve outcomes in patients with diastolic heart failure in patients who have relaxation problems in their heart. So there are a number of trials going on now that are looking at ways to improve the relaxation of the heart. The best way that we have right now in terms of improving the relaxation of the heart is by improving blood pressure. And unfortunately, we haven't found a good way to reverse the stiffness of the heart, but we have found ways to delay the progression of the stiffness of the heart. That happens with normal aging, as well as in patients who have high blood pressure. And so we tend to use medications to reduce blood pressure and also that reduce fibrosis in the heart. But that's very much a work in progress. Most of our treatments for patients with diastolic heart failure are treatments to improve their symptoms rather than improving the structural abnormalities that have developed in their heart. Yes, ma'am. I have this problem. I can hear my heartbeat. Is that normal? Or? So the question is, I can hear my heartbeat. Is that normal? Well, it's better than not hearing your heartbeat. <laughs> so, but but um, it is normal, actually. And, However, um, it can be a sign of some abnormalities. So um, in, particularly in patients who are thin, they can often hear their heartbeat because it turns out that the blood vessel that goes to your brain runs right by your ear. And so you can often hear your heartbeat and you can hear it pulsing, and which can be completely normal. Sometimes if patient's blood pressure gets higher, then you can, that can be augmented. So it might be a good idea to at least get your blood pressure checked, but it is perfectly normal to hear your heartbeat. Sometimes it goes fast. I can, I can feel it comes on, you know, like the heartbeat increase, you know, in seconds, goes from normal to 120. Okay. So the question is, and I think this is uh, another sign, not necessarily of heart failure, but a sign to tell your physician about. If my heart failure, or if my uh, heart rate goes up very quickly and abruptly, is that a problem? And it can be normal, because some people, even with minimal activity, if they're not used to minimal activity, can have a high increase in their heart rate. But it certainly could be abnormal. And that's something I would ask your physician about, yeah. because it could be a sign of a rhythm problem in your heart. I wear this more people. <coughs> Two weeks, this is nothing wrong. But so that's good. So one of the ways that we often tease out whether a, a rhythm problem is abnormal or not is by putting patients on a monitor. And we use this very frequently in our patients with heart failure. Uh, the monitors that we have now are a lot less cumbersome. It's just one patch you can put on rather than wearing all these 
leads. I'm not sure which monitor you got. So we have one now that you can, it's just one patch. It's a lot easier to wear. Just one patch. Okay, so we're getting close. So, okay, you had a question, sir. Yeah, um, I think you might have touched on it. The, the, the combination of uh, atrial fibrillation and heart failure, I mean, what, is that a specific danger? Or are they the same thing? Or? No, I, we haven't touched on that, and it's a very good question. So the question is, what about atrial fibrillation and heart failure? So for those who don't know, atrial fibrillation is a rhythm problem in the heart. And it's a problem in the top chamber of the heart. So the heart has two types of chambers, or, and there's four chambers in the heart. The two top chambers are called the atria from the Latin, because the atrium is at the top, right? And the two bottom chambers are the ventricles. Atrial fibrillation is a problem with the top chambers of the heart, and in particular with the left atrium, in that the electrical impulses are abnormal and irregular. And so what happens in patients with atrial fibrillation is that they have an irregular heartbeat. It turns out that the risk of atrial fibrillation, this irregular heartbeat, is higher in patients with heart failure. And so we do see quite a few patients who have both atrial fibrillation and heart failure, and we have to manage both of those problems. It can become difficult uh, because in patients with atrial fibrillation, they don't have as good heart function because the top chamber of the heart doesn't just have an electrical system, it also squeezes and delivers blood to the bottom chamber of the heart. So you can imagine if the top chamber of the heart is chaotic and irregular, it doesn't, develop, it doesn't uh, deliver blood regularly and efficiently to the bottom chamber of the heart. So we often do struggle in patients with heart failure in either trying to get them back into a normal rhythm or manage their atrial fibrillation to the point where their heart failure is not in bad shape. So, you know, I think that uh, in particular, so the question is, how do you treat a patient with, uh, with atrial fibrillation? And this is a bit controversial. Uh, there was a recent trial that showed that taking a patient out of atrial fibrillation in, who has heart failure didn't lead to any better outcomes than, than leaving them in atrial fibrillation. We tend to think there are some patients who do better out of atrial fibrillation, it sort of is common sense, in a normal rhythm than not. And the way we get them out of the atrial fibrillation is either shocking them, that's one way to do it, or using medications. I think that we're out of time. I'm sorry. Did you have a very quick question? What would be the significance of blood pressure systolic, like 110 one day, 135 the next day, everything else is similar? So the question is, what about fluctuations in blood pressure? It's 110 one day and 130. So the nice thing is that normally your blood pressure fluctuates. And if you were very, um, let's say obsessive compulsive, and you checked your blood pressure throughout the day, you would have diurnal variations in your blood pressure, such that it would be lower at night and higher during the day. And there are also day-to-day -day variations in blood pressure. Um, as long as the blood pressure is not abnormally high, it shouldn't be a problem. So the range from 110 to 130 that you mentioned is completely normal. But I try to run my, blood pre my heart failure patients as low as possible to unload their heart as much as possible. I start getting worried when the blood pressure even occasionally gets above 140. All right, I'm sorry, that's the last question, but thank you for coming.